Hey guys, I am here today with you. You're watching this recording because you want to learn a little bit more about your emotions and how you can become emotionally intelligent. So I am Ariana Pina, for those of you who do not know me. I have um, an absolute passion in personal and self-development, which led me onto these paths of discovering ways in which I can control and manage my own emotions and my own mind. I've studied with a woman called Rebecca Hinsey, which I'm going to go into a little bit more shortly, um, who has taught me all about how to manage my emotions um, by using essential oils and other self-care practices that I've picked up along the way. And so I'm going to spend the next hour teaching you what I know, um, not everything, of course, but in a very small snapshot of the, um, yeah, the really important parts about using essential oils and all the other, all other self-care practices. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen. I wonder, is that something that I can do? I can. Alrighty. Let's go here. And let us go here. Good. All right. We'll start from the beginning. This is the beautiful Rebecca Hensey who has um, poured some incredible work into teaching people on how to manage their emotions. Um, she has worked uh, in the mental health field for over two decades and is considered an expert in um, essential oils and mood. She's also a family issues specialist and an instructor of emotional intelligence for families and individuals. Rebecca is the international best-selling author of Healing Your Family History, which has been distributed worldwide. She is a creator of the Emotions Mentor course series, and she's the author of Essentially Happy, Essential Oils for Happy Living, and Emotions and Essential Oils, an A to Z guide. Today, Rebecca speaks to audiences worldwide on using essential oils for health and wellness, on healing family patterns, overcoming destructive behavior, increasing emotional intelligence, resolving healthcare issues naturally through essential oils and supplementation, and resolving family conflict. She holds a degree in communications from Brigham Young University and also a degree from the University of East London School of Psychology. So this woman knows her stuff and I've just been so honoured to spend some time with her, um, both in Australia but also mostly online, really learning from all of the things that she has such a passion for. Like it's just really so beautiful to watch. So. I suppose the the main crux of today's little mini webinar is to understand what is emotional intelligence and why is it important for us as a human species, as a, as a civilization, as a Western society to understand why emotional intelligence is so important. And so we may look at um, IQ, for example. I mean, I was brought up in a system where you got your IQ tested, right, in a school system, and your IQ was really important. Like, it, it depicted what it is that you were capable of and what sort of job you should go into and how intelligent you were, are, right? But um, this guy that you see on the screen now, his name's Dr. Daniel Goleman. He is an incredible guy, an incredible fella. If you haven't yet heard of this dude, Daniel Goleman, then please do yourself a favour and research his work. Um, he really started to bring emotional intelligence to the forefront. And so if we have to look at EQ versus IQ, emotional intelligence versus um, IQ, we know that our emotional quotient is defined as an individual's ability to identify and evaluate and control and even express emotions. Our in, um, intelligence quotient, which is what IQ stands for, is a score that's derived from one of several standardized tests, which are designed to assess an individual's intelligence. Right? So social scientists in general and psychologists are increasingly acknowledging that emotional intelligence is just as, if not more important than IQ, 
Um, when it comes to business, success in business and in life in general, so the difference between IQ and EQ, well, like I mentioned, IQ tests the brain strength, but it measures things like maths, um, logic, your verbal strength. Um, and EQ is more about our interactions with other people. So the capacity then to be aware of, to uh, be in control of, and to express your emotions and how you handle interpersonal relationships. Um, you know, are you empathetic? Um, are you judgmental? What is it that you do internally when you're around other people? How do you manage the way that you feel and the thoughts that you think about other people? And then how do you then react to the circumstances that are happening in your life? Um, it's really interesting, though, because, you know, the, the psychologist uh, Carl Jung, his work influenced a lot of psychiatry and religion and literature for more than 70 years. Um, and he said that emotion is the chief source of all becoming conscious. And I love that so much because our feelings are amazing and complex in nature. They are unique to each of each, each of us, like each of our experiences are very, very different. And yet nearly every emotion is common to each person on earth. Whether we feel fear or anger or sadness, um, whether we feel frustration, resentment, terror, joy, love, peace, forgiveness, gratitude, happiness, we all experience each one of these emotions on one level or another throughout our lives. It's the balance and the depth of these emotions which is critical to leading a happy and a healthy life. In fact, we propose, along with many others, that your emotional intelligence, or let's just call it EI from now on, is as important, if not more, than your IQ. So I'm gonna go with this, right? I'm gonna do the rest of this presentation with us all assuming that our EQ is far more important when it comes to the success of our lives, whether it be in business or personal lives, um, more important than our IQ. A person's EI is defined by the ability to identify and to use and understand and manage our emotions. It's powerful stuff, guys. It encompasses the following five characteristics and abilities. So we need to have self-awareness, we need to have self-regulation. We need to have self-motivation, um, empathy, and also social skills. In 1995, there was a report on the current state of emotional illiteracy in the US. And Daniel Goleman wrote a really good paragraph about it, which I'd really love to read to you now. He says that in navigating our lives, it is our fears and envies, our rages and depressions, our worries and anxieties that steer us day to day. Even the most academically brilliant among us are vulnerable to being undone by unruly emotions. The price we pay for emotional illiteracy is in failed marriages, troubled families, in stunted social and work lives, in deteriorating physical health and mental anguish, and as a society, in tragedies such as killings. And so by reading and understanding that paragraph, we can take why it is so important for us to have a high emotional intelligence because it's not only how we self-regulate and how we see ourselves in the world, but then how we project and how we are in our society and our communities. Goldman says that the best remedy for battling emotional shortcomings is preventative medicine. In other words, we need to place an importance on teaching our children and ourselves how to develop skills emotionally as we do on teaching them academic skills. You know, how, you know, we put a lot of pressure on our kids to go to school and to learn how to do math, but do we teach them how to be in social circles, how to regulate their own emotions? Um, I think it's just such an important part of our lives that nobody teaches us. Unless you've got parents who are emotionally aware, you're not going to learn how to do this unless you are taught in your adulthood. And so it's really important that we as mothers, as sisters, 
as um, aunts and uncles that we learn how to teach the children of the next generation these things. So you've probably had this moment in your life where uh, you've sent an email that you've regretted or you've said something hurtful to someone in a moment of fury. Yeah, those regretful things that are said or done, you can't take them back. You can't unsay or undo hurtful things. And it's important for your happiness and the happiness of others that you learn how to manage your emotions, which will then lead to a happier life in general. Emotional intelligence is the ability to understand our own emotions so that they can affect us in a positive way. A high EI or EQ um, will ensure that we communicate better. We will reduce our anxiety and our stress. We can diffuse conflicts and improve relationships and empathize with others. We can effectively overcome or work through life's challenges. It affects the quality of our lives because it influences our behavior and our relationships. It's synonymous with self-awareness because it enables us to live our lives with intention, with uh, purpose and autonomy. And so many of us move through life, we make decisions, um, and we base those decisions on our current circumstances. We may perceive them as being beyond our ability to change. Oh my goodness, this is getting juicy, right? Because when we perceive something as beyond our capacity to change, we limit our options and our solutions. By taking the time to reflect and examine why we decide to do what we do, right? That enables us to lead lives determined by our conscious interactions rather than the circumstances. So we get to choose the way that we think and the way that we act in this world. Developing our emotional intelligence can then greatly influence our success, right? You think happy thoughts, you will be happy and therefore I live a happy life. It's how simple it is really. Of course, it's so much more complex, but but that's the crux of it, super simple. Our personal situations and intelligence, um, they're factors, right? They're factors that we have, they're circumstances in our lives, but our emotional intelligence can profoundly affect our choices by creating options we may not have otherwise imagined or considered to be possibilities. It's powerful stuff. Let us backtrack just a little bit here, right? So we're talking about the brain. We're talking about thoughts that we think that are created in our brain, which we'll go into how these thoughts originated in our brain and how they came about to be in our brain. We'll go through that later. But let's look at a representation of the, the brain. Let's look at the brain and understand a little bit about how we can manage our minds and our moods by understanding our brain and how it works. One of the key areas of your brain that deals with showing, recognizing, controlling uh, the body's reactions to emotions is known as the limbic system. The neurons in your happy hippocampus play a role um, in emotions. So look at this drawing here, this sketch. You'll notice that there are various parts of the brain. The, the, the part that I just mentioned now is bottom right hand side, the hippocampus. This is responsible for the learning um, that we do in the beginning of our lives mostly, um, and then our memory. And then just above that in a little red dot is our amygdala. So this is the emotional stress response part of our brain. And then the blue parts right at the top, we'll call them the, the prefrontal cortex, which is where, um, this is our thinking brain, a logical brain. I want us to bring our attention to the little red dot for now as we talk about something called an amygdala hijack, right? Da this is Dr. Daniel Goldman. He explains to us, uh, he termed this, this, or he coined the term, um, an amygdala hijacking uh, in his book called Emotional Intelligence. Uh, and what it is essentially is an immediate and overwhelming emotional response out of proportion to the stimulus because it's triggered a more significant emotional threat. 
So basically, you react to something that's been said to you um, in, in almost in a way that's totally blown out of proportion, not because of what was said to you, but because it triggers a response, perhaps um, a deep underlying belief that you may, you, know, you may believe about yourself. I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. Um, all of these underlying limiting beliefs, which we'll touch on later on. But, but the minute that someone triggers a response in us like that, like an amygdala hijacking, it's a really great opportunity for us to turn the mirror back on ourselves and understand what is it that is uh, triggering us and why is it that we are responding this way? Why is my amygdala hijacking the rest of my brain, this emotional response, why is it, it, it trig, why is this trigger hijacking the way that I'm reacting? So I've got this really cool little clip um, by a woman uh, that I just really love the way she explained what an amygdala hijacking is. I hope that this is going to play because she doesn't seem to be coming up. Let's see. All right, this looks better. This looks more promising. You ready? Have you ever said or done anything that you later regretted? Something in the heat of the moment. Have you ever yelled at a stranger? What about in traffic? Well, you may just have been the victim of an amygdala hijack. Good news, there's a better way. You can train your brain through mindfulness to be less emotionally reactive. In this video, you will learn what amygdala hijacking is, why it happens, and what to do about it. Daniel Goleman, author of Emotional Intelligence, coined the term amygdala hijack to refer to an immediate and overwhelming emotional reaction disproportionate to the stimulus because it triggers a deeper emotional threat, like the threat of your life. Many of you may know that the amygdala is part of the brain that is responsible for your emotional reaction. What you may not know is that this little guy is a brain bandit. It goes and it steals the functioning of other areas of your brain. So the amygdala comes up and shuts off the neocortex, the area in the front that is responsible for logical thinking, conscious thoughts, and sensory perception. So your logic is overridden with emotion. That's when it hijacks that front part of your brain. To understand why this happens, let's back up several thousands of years ago. A beautiful morning you're just getting up you're coming out of your cave you're going to pick some berries and you look over you see a rustling in the bushes and out peers the head of a saber-toothed tiger there's saliva coming down from his jaws he's thinking one thing he's looking at you and he's thinking breakfast and your amygdala thankfully has hijacked your neocortex because this is not a time for digestion or ovulation and with your neocortex hijacked, you have two thoughts available to you. Do I eat it or does it eat me? And you ran. At least your ancestors did. Sadly, there are no descendants of those who did not run. You see, we are the descendants of the people who had the amygdalas that knew how to get away from the saber-toothed tiger. In today's world, it's like there's a stressor and boom, amygdala hijacked. The stressor may be an email, a text message, your boss, a bill being late, somebody in traffic. So it's not that our life is in threat, but it triggers that old part of our brain to come up as if we were about to be eaten by a tiger. Not only that, it floods our entire system with adrenaline and cortisol. It could pump through our body for up to four hours. That's right, we can have an amygdala hijack hangover. Four hours of those hormones pumping through us. Have you ever experienced that? Where after a big emotional situation, you still feel angry or rage, confusion, overwhelm, upset, fear? That would be the amygdala hijack hangover. Luckily, there are things we can do about this. Thomas Jefferson said, if you are angry, count to 10. And if you're really angry, count to 100. He had a good point. Very wise, because when you count, you are switching on the neocortex. So the part of your brain that has been such shut off by the amygdala hijacking gets put back on. So if you start to count while you feel that intense emotion, you can have some space from it. 
Another thing that you could do is take deep mindful breaths. When you bring your attention over and over again to the breath, each breath as you have it, you bring yourself into the moment and you calm yourself down. The sympathetic nervous system is responsible for fight or flight. And we have the parasympathetic nervous system. That's the rest and digest. So when we take those deep mindful breaths, we are activating this parasympathetic nervous system with a net result is that we feel peaceful. There is lots of information about the effectiveness of mindfulness, not just in the moment, but it's long-term effects. There's an eight week course called MBSR that's been around for 25 years. And then this mindfulness based stress reduction course, they measure some of the people's brains before and after the eight weeks doing an MRI. And it shows after that the area in the amygdala is different. So we are burning new neural pathways by meditating and doing the mindfulness practice, that there are structural differences in our brain as a result of the practice. So in another study where in as little as four days of 20 minutes a day of mindfulness practice, that is enough to see a significant difference on tests. So I encourage you to start your own mindfulness practice today and begin burning those new neural pathways. You don't have to yell at strangers and you don't have to get lost and swept up in the emotions. You can actually be present, you can count or you can breathe, creating some space from the actual stimulus, working with your old brain, but having new behavior for it. You come over to Richard. Ex How cool. How cool is that, right? So we get to, we get to now play around with ways in which we can train our brains. So you know how she mentioned that there are neural pathways and that the more you, um, the more you think a harmful thought, the deeper that those trenches become, those neural pathways. The idea is that I mean, it's pretty similar to this picture, right? These, these cows are going to be walking the same path every day from one pasture to the other. And in time, the street, the little street that they've created um, becomes deeper entrenched in the earth, right? They part the way of that the grass parts. And so the path then becomes um, wider um, and more trampled where you can see a significant pathway, right? This is the same thing that we have in our brains, right? So you have a tiny little path. So say, for example, we've decided that we want to now start creating new neural pathways in our brain and we start using new mindful practices, whether they be meditation, whether they be affirmations or um, journaling or ways that we can start to re create the neural pathways in our brain to serve us rather than to um, inhibit our thinking, we can start then recreating these little pathways just like this. So you would move from something like a very wide path, which has been established perhaps from your childhood, perhaps um, a, a pattern that you have picked up or a genetic um, habit that you've learned from your parents or their parents, we can then start to recreate the way that we think. And in the beginning, we're going to have to part these this way, right? We're going to have to recreate this path and start to trample out the grass. And it's going to take time for us to walk this path again and again and again so that it can start to separate and become something that is easily visible. And in time, the more we practice it, the more solid this path will become until one day it's the new norm. Right? One day, we won't have to think about not shouting at the guy who crosses us in the street because he cut us off. We won't have to think about shouting at our spouse or reacting because their socks are on the floor. It will become a natural reaction to be calm and restful and approach the subject in a way that serves the relationship and ourselves in general. Does that make sense? So it's a really powerful tool and I love the images that were given um, in this presentation because it gives us a very good understanding of how we can um, 
we have the power to recreate these neural pathways. So I mentioned a little bit the neural pathways, they establish themselves over time. Um, I mentioned that we can learn these, you know, we may have learned them from when we were really young. So, you know, taught and assumed family patterns. Um, they can be partly genetic, although there is epigenetics, so we can change those things. We used to think that we can't change them. Like, you know, that was the way I was born. Um, it's part of my genes. Well, now we know we can change those things. It can be partly social influence. So, you know, maybe a cultural aspect, um, you know, uh, perhaps you live in a, in a place where it is the norm to be quite passionate and scream and shout. And that is the norm is actually not considered rude or over the top. Um, but what we don't realize is that by being that way, it can trigger this amygdala hijacking, which then triggers the stress response in the body, which isn't that great for us. Um, we can also establish these neural pathways by experiences, um, also by various differences in our personality. So things that have happened to us in our lives, um, limiting beliefs that we've picked up over time, whether they be from our childhood or even in our adulthood, where we've made a conscious decision that we're not going to do something because perhaps we were hurt or perhaps um, we were ridic rid ridiculed or laughed at. You know, all of these life experiences will contribute to the way that we are and our personality. And, you know, I'm an avid yogi. I practice yoga and have studied many of the teachings of yoga. And um, we always talk about having beginner's mind. We talk about being in a place where we don't have all of these afflictions and these experiences taint and, and jade our view on the world, that we start right at the beginning every single day um which is at a you know from from a place of real calm and um and, and i say rest because it's it's a a really grounded way to be where we don't allow all of these experiences to then recreate the way we act in our lives so just again let's quickly look at this image here this is the part the frontal lobe that she was talking about where when you start counting to 10 you switch this guy on and it takes away from the amygdala hijack that happens um, in the middle of the brain got it deep breaths whatever it is that that's going to work for you and i'll give you some other techniques here as well um, while we're talking about the brain, let's look at the neurotransmitters that define our behavior. This is the fun part. So we're going to get a bit sciencey, not too much, just a small tidbit that helps you understand why essential oils are so incredibly powerful in helping us to mitigate bad behavior and also to almost manipulate our mood. So the six neurotransmitters that define our behavior in the brain um, are dopamine, there's serotonin, norepinephrine, acetylcholine, GABA, and glutamate. And so by looking at each of these neurotransmitters uh, very briefly, we will learn a couple of cool and important things that are going to help us manage our mood. So in the brain, we have this neurotransmitter called dopamine. Um, it's a chemical which is released by neurons, which are also known as nerve cells. They send signals to other nerve cells. And so the brain includes several distinct dopamine pathways, one of which plays a major role in the motivational component of reward motivated behavior. So this is like the feel good hormone. Okay. One study found that bergamot, that lavender and lemon essential oils are particularly therapeutic when it comes to increasing dopamine in the brain. So you can use your sense of smell which will then prompt the brain to release serotonin and dopamine. My favorite on this list that you can see on your screen now is lemon. Why? Because she is cheap and she's cheerful. And you can use her for a myriad of functions in and around your home. So taking a deep breath in of lemon will then stimulate the secretion of dopamine in the brain, which are our feel-good hormones. And so whenever you're feeling a little bit down and out, my suggestion is to grab a citrus, lemon, 
you know, nine times out of 10, you'll have lemon in your home. And so we'll talk about um, clarity and purity and efficacy of essential oils because not all oils are made equal. There are specific types of essential oils, in particular doTERRA's a blend that I advocate for. And I would never recommend using any other brand other than doTERRA if, the, if you're looking for um, the success that we have experienced with uh, mood by using essential oils. Um, and so, yeah, let's, let's get into essential oils a little bit later, but first understanding the brain and how it kind of works. We'll also look at uh, foods, of course, essential oils are not the only way. So we've now looked at mindful practices, practices, essential oils, but of course, what we do and what we eat is going to highly affect the, uh, the secretion of these hormones. So alongside exercise, um, which is also incredibly beneficial for our brain and our feeling, our feel, our good feelings in life, we can look at foods, of course. What we put into our mouth to eat is so important. So foods that increase our dopamine are things like chocolate, almonds, apples, avocados, um, you know, all of these really beautiful, um, I would say high, like your almonds and your avos, really good fats. And when I say chocolate, I'm not talking about your milk chocolate. I'm talking about dark chocolate. Anything from 70% dark chocolate upwards, 70, 80, 90%, this is where you're going to get a really good influx of dopamine into the, into the body and therefore the brain. Or into the brain, therefore the body. The second neurotransmitter we talk about is serotonin. This little guy gets talked about quite a lot, right? Serotonin is uh, a chemical nerve uh, cell. It sends signals between your nerve cells, sorry. Serotonin is found mostly in the digestive system. This is so important. Nobody talks about this stuff because it's also in blood platelets and throughout the central nervous system. Serotonin is made from the essential amino acid tryptophan. The amino acid must enter your body through your diet, right? So that it goes into the stomach. It's commonly found in foods such as nuts, cheese, and red meat. A tryptophan deficiency can lead to lower serotonin levels, which can result in mood disorders such as anxiety or depression. The serotonin transporter alters the activity of serotonin in the brain by reducing levels of neuroactive serotonin. It transports serotonin out of the synaptic cleft and returns it to the presynaptic neuron in a process called reuptake. Um, so when we have limited serotonin reuptake, this is a way to maintain proper serotonin activity. And proper serotonin activity promotes feelings of happiness and helps regulate ap appetite and then sleep. Scientists have also discovered that lavender and linalool, so there are many other essential oils that have lavender in it, uh, sorry, linalool in it, a major constituent of lavender and, um, and other oils like pettigrain and, and other, other oils. They were able to bind to the serotonin transporter, indicating that these oils have a really good effect on mood and sleep and may involve modulation of the serotonin transporter. One possibility is that lavender binding to the transporter might have inhibitory effects on the serotonin reuptake. These compelling results validate the use of lavender essential oil for its soothing and calming effects, as well as its ability to promote sleep. The study is yet another instance of science confirming the traditional use of essential oils. Right. So then we've spoken about these, um, these food sources as well. Norepinephrine is a naturally occurring chemical in the body that acts as both a stress hormone and a neurotransmitter a substance that sig sends signals between nerve cells. It is released into the blood as stress hormone when the brain perceives that a stressful event has occurred. Out of these oils here that you see on your screen, my favorite is grapefruit. If you take a deep breath of grapefruit, there is slightly increased epinephrine 
and norepinephrine levels in the body, which I just love that you can just open up a bottle of essential oils, take a deep breath in, and it actually affects the chemical um, the chemicals within your brain. It's just incredible. I love this little drawing here, which shows us how serotonin, norepinephrine and dopamine have just got such an incredible um, way to support one another. Um, and they, they kind of bind in together to help us feel incredibly good. We have um, foods that are really great uh, to support norepinephrine, your cheese, cottage cheese, meats, tuna, chicken, turkey. And then we've got acetylcholine. Um, this is the chemical um, that causes muscle, not muscles, muscles to contract. It activates pain responses and regulates endocrine and REM sleep functions. Right, so the oils that are associated with acetylcholine um, that I really love are rosemary. Right? Rosemary is just an incredible oil to help the body relax. In fact, when I was doing a lot of training and my body would go into spasms, I would use uh, rosemary blended in some coconut oil to rub all over my muscles. And so this helps to release um, acetylcholine um, which then regulates these responses, just helping the muscles to relax somewhat. It's pretty incredible, isn't it? We'll move then uh, to the foods, high dairy fat products. High dairy, high fat dairy products. All right. And we go on to GABA. Well, this is a... Um, an interesting neurotransmitter. Um, I'm going to get into GABA a little bit later, right? But for now, let's just know that GABA has got oils that are really, really, um, sorry, oils that are really great for GABA are your clary sage, rose, lemon, geranium, sandalwood. These oils are really great to support uh, the stimulation of GABA. But the foods, um, I love the banana because it's just um, almost instant um, gratification. Beef lover, broccoli, brown rice, halibut, lentils, oats, and whole grain. The last, uh, the last one that we're going to get into is glutamate. Um, and glutamate is a powerful uh, neurotransmitter that is released by nerve cells in the brain. It is responsible for sending signals between nerve cells and under normal conditions, it plays an important role in learning and memory, which is why bergamot and lavender are so incredibly important to use when you're looking to remember things, right? To recall on the brain's uh, memory function. So when you look at... Um, essential oils and how they have such an incredible role to play in our moods. We, we know that um, they can help you get ready for work by motivating you. They can give you a push out the door so that you go to your gym workout. And they can also help you cope a little easier when you're having a stressful day at work or simply just overwhelmed at home, whether it's housework or perhaps, you know, family conditions. Um, but now that we've kind of looked at the various ways, uh, at the various oils that can help stimulate the production of um, neurotransmitters in the brain, let's look at how these oils can work and why. Why? Why do these oils work so well? Well, understanding that emotional intelligence requires so many different levels of awareness um, is your first step because. An essential oil is not just going to jump its way out of the bottle and support you. You have to have a sense of self-awareness in order for the oils to actually have an effect. And so part two of this video series, we're going to start looking at um, essential oils and how they can assist us in the um, increasing of emotional intelligence and why it is that not only using essential oils are going to support that, but other um, healthcare practices, self-care practices are so important for us to um, live a life that is um, happy 
and live a life that is in alignment with what our true values are and not allow our amygdala hijacking just to take over. Because a lot of the times you may have sent that email and regretted it or said those words and regretted it. And then it's, then it starts the spiral effect of what happens once you realize that you can't take those things back. So let's take it back a step and understand how we can then start to mitigate those risks of being someone who we actually don't want to be, how we can increase our social skills, how we can become more self-aware um, by using self-management practices and also being more socially aware in general. So I hope that you join me for part two of the series. I hope that you've enjoyed this, in, this uh, introductory to uh, emotional intelligence and how it works in the brain and how important it is for us as humans to understand that we have the power to change our thoughts, to change our moods, our behaviors, and therefore change our lives. Um, and so I'll see you for round two in the next video.